visitor centres and wildlife activities may be private sector, such as the Woodside Balcony Conservation Centre, for example, basically reusing uh, either farm or industrial outbuildings uh, and putting them to a low cost, quite effective use as a, a wildlife tourism facility. And what we're seeing over the period is a number of small business initiatives growing up, set in the, the landscape context I talked about earlier, the countryside, which provides a backdrop of the framework, and also perhaps uh, tapping into bigger neighbours with conservation bodies within the same area, the same locale. So once you've got one visitor experience, that can be a growth pole. That can be a growth pole for others to follow and also for the local economy. This is an international ex example. This is um, a, la a lady called Lisa Salmon, who had a little bungalow, actually quite a grand bungalow in the mountains in Jamaica. Um, and she had a veranda and balcony area where she could seat about 30 people. And you would sit there and she would call the birds to come and visit and feed. And she would speak to the different woodpeckers individually by name and they would come to her. Uh, and what's happening here is this lady is actually feeding a hummingbird on a little sugar feeder there. Um, and the amazing thing was it, a, it employed a few guys helping to run the place. So it's sort of tapping into that uh, economic impact, but also it had a big impact on people. If you looked at her visitor book, you've got people like Ted Heath, British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, Prince Philip, Prince Charles, various American presidents had all been to visit this place and talk to this lady. Absolutely fantastic. Or to absolutely dramatic major investments and landscape transformations. So this is a clay pit in Cornwall, which of course becomes this, the Eden Project. So absolutely dramatic impact. And the Eden Project, unlike the Earth Centre, you know, the Earth Centre could have been the Eden Project, if you see what I mean. Um, the Eden Project was very, very carefully planned, very carefully implemented. It has environmentally community-friendly transport, but it also welcomes car visitors too, because they're realistic in terms of how people are going to get there. It's a remote place and the bulk of the visitors drive. And until things change, well, that's going to be the situation. So realistically, that's what you're going to get. And they have had over a million visitors a year ever since. They've had a few sticky periods when uh, bad weather combined with high petrol prices caused a drop in visitor numbers. And they had to, to lose some stuff at one point. But overall, they've been very, very clever. They... Um, use the Lost Gardens of Heligan as a sort of launch pad. And that and the Eden Project were very clever initiatives because there's actually a lot of Lost Gardens. Heligan is not the only one and probably isn't the most spectacular, but they created a sort of myth of the Lost Gardens quite remarkably. Uh, and it's very successful. And with both the Lost Gardens and Heligan, they managed to get huge amounts of media coverage and I knew quite a few people who went down every year to find out. They almost felt like they knew Tim Smith personally, and they would go down and see what Tim was doing this year. And the media the same. You know, you get a two-page spread in the Times or The Guardian, um, and that is worth a huge amount of advertising money when you're getting the coverage for free. They have pop concerts. They have other events, et cetera, et cetera, uh, TV programmes. It's all good publicity and it works really, really well. So a big investment, big risk, but potentially big payback. So what sort of facilities do we need if we're going to grow tourism? <clears throat> so parking, access toilets, food, drink, refreshment shops, education, interpretation, displays, rangers and the warden or ranger base.
And I like this one. This is, it's gone now, of course. This is the one at Sherwood. It used to be Robin Hood's Sherwoody. Um, and I like that. You link to a country park. So you've got a country park reception where you get the serious stuff. But the uh, Robin Hood's Sherwoody, that was great. Uh, and my overseas visitors loved it. It was so naff, it was good. Uh, and I understand why we've had to move it out from the, the forest because it's a protected area, but it has something authentic about it being actually in the forest near to the great tree. So people really felt that they were experiencing part of that. Um, and it has lost a lot by moving it away from there. So issues, information, experience, it, is, it, is the information you're going to be giving out passive or active? Are you making it free or fee paid? Lots of museums now have become free and they hope that you'll pay in the restaurant and the cafe and the shop. So sometimes you make more money through free access because you get more visitors through. You need to be very careful and think about things like disabled access and access for all. Um, what's the balance between education and fun fair? The Disney effect. Very, very difficult. Presentation versus discovery. I mean, you do have these things where you sit on the seat and someone famous talks to you from a recording about what you should see. To me, that's horrendous. Maybe for some people, they enjoy it. I know a lot of people really do not like it. It's just over the top. Um, and then, you know, what other resources are there and what other resources do you need? But opportunities to spend, very important. If you're going to bring money in, if you're going to capture that money in the local economy, then you have to actually find ways to spend it to get the money off people. What I call the Robin Hood effect. You've got to rob people. Um, people love to spend money. That's why they go to these places. And my Polish and Ukrainian visitors would come out of the heritage shop with NAF Robin Hood pencils and memorabilia and Nicky Nacks. And they loved it. And also they take that away. They show that to friends. It spreads the message. You know, it's great PR. It's great publicity. Your best marketing is by word of mouth through people that enjoyed visiting. There can be an uneasy relationship between information centres, retail, public sector, private sector. So we, here in the Lake District in Cumbria, we have one of the strongest tourism economies probably in Britain in part of it. The Western area, it's different, but Windermere and that area, it's a booming economy. Here at Hawkshead, you've got a distinctive local brand being manufactured on the back of the town's name, and it brings in loads of people. And there used to be an information base there to welcome people and tell them where they can go, where they can visit in the countryside, where they can stay, what they might see what they might experience. But the Lake District National Park closed down the information centre. So you've now got huge numbers of tourists coming here with no information, lots of overseas tourists who may not have English as a first language. And they don't know where they're supposed to be going. They don't know where to get accommodation. They don't have any information about the area because we closed it down despite the huge amount of footfall and the huge amount of visitor spend and what's often neglected, the consequence of all that being VAT and income tax and other tax receipts to the exchequer. And my argument is that if you don't want to kill the golden goose, let's have some of that money back and invested in facilities like this. Now, the local authority doesn't get the money to run this. You have to put the money in through the tax system. So you cross subsidize, that's how it works. That's how the economy works, it's not rocket science. So you get these situations where you've got a commercial side that isn't contributing to this, and this is not viable because we as a community don't fund our public services. So some big, big issues. And you can see, you can find some information because here there's a market force acting, the boat operators, and they, you know, there's fantastic old steam boats and things that you can go down Coniston, and you can go across to where John Ruskin's house is and all this sort of stuff. So they have a business interest in providing the information for you. 
So there's a direct link between the uh, provision of information, the delivery of the experience, and the economic benefits of those local people. But when there isn't, we need to spend public money. Now, sometimes the money is spent in a more creative way. So this is um, Carsington Water in North Derbyshire. And this was built on investment for water infrastructure. It's a water storage reservoir for drinking water. And on the back of it was a visitor centre um, around walk and cycleway and riding way and everything else spun out from that. But the basic cost, the, the investment, was on the back of water supply. And everything else spun out from that. So you then got the issues of funding finance, as I said before, capital and revenue. And here you've got your capital put into the landscape, into the facility, etc. And then the revenue to run those facilities is paid for by the visitor spend. And again, like the Eden Project, uh, Carsington had over a million visitors a year, every year since inception. So fantastically successful. The fund, the, the revenue to pay for the actual reservoir upkeep is obviously paid for out of the water supply uh, income. So here we've got funding, finance, capital and revenue, networking centres, trails and sites, and we're looking at growing the experience and the attractiveness of the location. Well, <clears throat> what I mean by networking is, you know, this links in to long distance routeways. Old Moor in the Dern Valley it links into the Trans Pennine Trail and a whole plethora of other uh, networks and routeways that spin off that. So the cycleways, the horse riding routes, there are walking trails. And the idea is to then link from your core site, your growth pole, to other areas around the region. So you grow the visitor experience, you enhance the attractiveness of the location. You also need to balance adverse impacts and over commercialization. Uh, Land's End is a classic case of a, a beautiful natural landscape with huge wildlife and heritage uh, benefits. But the owner at one point was really making it horribly over commercial in order to trigger. Um, the sale of much of it to conservation organisations simply to stop the commercial uh, over exploitation damaging it. It's still a very successful commercial enterprise and huge numbers of visitors going there, but there's a much better balance now between the natural environment, the heritage and the commercial arm. Now, if you've got an existing attraction, say Whitby, Whitby Abbey, then a little bit like Sherwood Forest and the Major Oak, in many ways you don't need to do much. It's all there on a plate. You've got the history where the Abbey is, you've got human occupation from prehistoric to the present day and everything in between. I mean, it's a fantastic, historic, iconic landscape. But you've also got not only a, a major uh, link to the development of Christianity, but also um, all the literary associations and the goth experience linked to the Count Dracula idea. So that is a gift for tourism. And if you've never been, then do go to the Dracula experience at Whitby. It's Whitby's equivalent to the Sherwood Forest um, Robin Hoody experience. It's great. Um, it's so scary when a man switches a light off. You know, you can always see him with stuff by the light switch. Oh, the lights go off and you're in pitch black. It's very sophisticated. So, is your uh, visitor experience is it static or mobile? Well, sometimes you might view from a, a fixed location, or you might have, in this case, like a seal safari along the coast. You know, you might actually be uh, might be informal position, informal. Um, facilities, provision uh, along cliff tops, viewing wild nature. It might actually be a mobile facility taking you to view the, the coastal experience. So we have wild assets, we have wild nature. These are fantastic resources. 
And as I say, some of it can be uh, not terribly authentic. Um, again, this is, this is just wonderfully enough. This is a, a sailing ship at Bridlington, and it's just a modern ship converted, um, completely skull and crossbones and pirate flag. And people love it. So if that's what it takes, that's what it takes, because you're trying to look at diversifying what is a, a slightly troubled economy, and you are looking at things like seal watching trips, bird watching trips, and uh, trips out to sea as a would be pirate. And it's linked into mass tourism and everything that goes with that. Um, but you're just trying to sort of see how uh, the wildlife experience can link into this economically, how it can support it. And what the wildlife tourism tends to do, it tends to be a sort of a top end in terms of spend. So maybe fewer people, but higher spend. But also what wildlife tourism does in many locations is it extends the holiday season or the tourism season. So a lot of tourism, as I said already, is very fickle, very seasonal. Um, and that causes problems for economies, be they rural economies, be they coastal economies. Um, and the wildlife and heritage can extend that experience. It extends the season. So that can be really important. And economic planners need to take that into account because it can make a big difference. And the wildlife, history, heritage, and some of the other countryside recreational activities can start to bring in quite a lot of high spending visitors. And you can embed this in the existing local economy to strengthen it and to diversify it. And you can use the existing economy as part of the backdrop story for the history and heritage and the culture of your visiting. So linking from Bridlington and the mass tourism to Flamborough Head and the lighthouse. And then of course you've got the, the old historic lighthouse as well. And then you've got the cliff top walks and you've got the boat trips. So you've got the whole set of different experiences. And as I said before, what people like are spectacles and spectaculars. And they can't be much better than being on top of the cliffs with the smell of uh, the seabirds and the sea, viewing things like uh, seals at close quarters and spectacular numbers of birds breeding, calling, and the whole, the whole experience is absolutely fantastic. And people will, even if you're not a keen naturalist or bird watcher, you will enjoy that sort of experience. And this is what brings the visitors in. And it's what brings them to return again and again. So you might be hoping that the, the specialist interest people come again for particular things, but also that uh, casual visitors will come for a day out, for a weekend break, for a weekend holiday. And you have to be careful about uh, over tourism and over visiting. So where you've got seals, you may need to manage the experience, but this can bring huge benefits. It's a chance for people to actually view wildlife at fairly close quarters and to get interest in it and to think about conservation, et cetera, et cetera. And having uh, seals coming ashore to pup and to breed can be a reliable spectacular. You want these experiences to be able to guarantee a result. You want to guarantee an experience. You don't want visitors turning up and there's nothing to see. And with wildlife, that can sometimes be difficult. If you're a hardened bird watcher, you just take that for granted. You, you know, sometimes you get something, sometimes you don't. For a tourism visitor, they want a spectacular or a spectacle, and they generally want it fairly easily. So Donna Nook um, on the Lincolnshire coast has upward of, you know, I think five, 10,000 gray seals, which are magnificent animals coming ashore to the rookery every October, November. So you know they're gonna be there. Um, and you can see hotels, restaurants, B&Bs, pubs, badging themselves with the, the grey seals and the Donna Nook experience. What I don't see is much clever entrepreneurship in terms of conservation bodies uh, securing the visitor spend. 
the last time I went, you could buy a little stuffed, um, fluffy uh, baby seal. Not a real one, obviously. Um, uh, a little model. And apart from that, you could buy a burger in the car park. And that was um, a private enterprise thing. But there's nowhere really to actually get uh, get the money off people. You know, where how are we getting it? We can maybe get people to join up as members and put money back in that way. But probably we need to be a bit cleverer about how we market these things and how we grow the tourism experience. And you should be thinking about if we've got, I think we're 60,000 visitors were coming in at one point, quite reliably for those few months. How do we get those people to come back to the area for other wildlife experiences during other times of the year? So that's the sort of question that we need to raise. What we do find is that once you've got an experience, once you've got an attraction, that private enterprise will follow. So here we've got the Far Niles um, and you've got the St. Cuthbert. So you can get a boat with local fishermen and they will take you out and tell you about the, the islands and the birds and the wildlife and the history. And that's helping to protect the birds and it's putting money back into the local economy and it's educating the visitors. So from that point of view, it's a, a win-win. If we're trying to grow the local tourism experience, we need to think about how we move from local people today visitors to tourists. And essentially, the local visitors are the easy, low-hanging fruit, but they're the low spend. Day visitors get slightly better, and the overnight has increased the spend dramatically because you're staying overnight and you're buying meals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, to weekenders, to longer stay tourists. And then the uh, gold pot at the end of the rainbow, international visits. This gets much, much more difficult, but potentially higher spend. So in the humble levels, for example, <clears throat> we have the John Wesley um, Methodist Church connection. And when there's a, an important anniversary, then you can get huge numbers of high spend overseas tourists coming here. I would question how effective we've been at actually marketing that, retaining that, or actually drawing those visitors back again. So that is something where this is where your, your wider tourism marketing comes in. And I don't see it at the moment. There are other things to think about. <clears throat> Business visitors, again, are often relatively easy if you've got the right uh, resources and settings. So a nice hotel, either purpose built or maybe in an old manor house or something like that with a golf course nearby and other facilities. And what you're trying to think about there is A, getting the business in, and that's usually done by a private enterprise. And there are, you know, there are lots of opportunities for business meetings and business tourism. You also get business uh, people traveling as part of their actual work, who will want to stay in an area. And in both cases, they're relatively high spend. And what you're then looking for are return visits and hoping that they will maybe think, oh, this is a nice area. I'll come back there for a, a weekend break or something, bring the family. There are issues about <coughs> leakage. If you have a, an inherently weak <coughs> local economy, then it's what we call leaky. So if you put £100 in, 95 pounds that goes out immediately and is lost. <clears throat> Whereas what you're looking to do is to grow local supply <clears throat> and encourage local employment, because that way you retain the spend <clears throat> in the locale. So if you put 100 pounds in, 95 pounds of it is spent again in the economy, <clears throat> that 90 pounds is spent again, or that 85 pounds is spent again. So you're getting these repeat spending uh, cycles and therefore you get more bang for your book. There are also things to think about in terms of educational visits. And I remember talking to a senior person in um, the South Yorkshire Tourism Office at the time. And he said, I don't see the point of educational visits. And I said, I think you're completely wrong because school visits during the week may keep your facility open, they may keep the cafe open, 
you may get a little bit of income into the shop. But the key thing is if the kids have enjoyed it and go home and talk about it, they may well bring the parents or grandparents back at the weekend. And then you get a proper cycle of further visits and more spending. Engaging tourism with the local community is very important. This is where something like Carsington doesn't really work too well because it's embedded in the local business community. So lots and lots of places, hotels, restaurants, and things like that are opened up. But the ranger service on site doesn't engage with local villages, local schools, local communities. So this is the difference between a, a business-led model, water company in that case, and a local authority or conservation body model where uh, the rangers and wardens might well be more in, active and engaged. <laughs> when you're developing your tourism offer, you need to think about user profiles, issues of seasonality, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to be planning ahead. One of the big challenges is the standard tourism life cycle. So here uh, you get exploration, involvement, development of the steep curve. This is where everything's going well. Consolidation, stagnation, decline. Now the Eden Project and uh, Lost Gardens have managed to keep reinventing themselves. So they keep bouncing along and going up and up and up. The typical seaside holiday resorts never saw the Mediterranean holidays coming, never saw cheap flights coming, etc., etc. They were doing really well, and then suddenly they went into a decline. And for some of them, they never come out of it. Because once you're in that decline situation, then you've got a problem with PR, of promotion, and image. And that's one thing I've suggested about the Humber Head Levels and about the Ancombe Valley, is that, and, the, and the Humber itself in many ways, um, one of the big challenges is image. It's the established place in the marketplace as a competitive destination. And I think we have a long, long way to go. We've got the assets, we've got the transport, we've even got the communities now, we've got a growing population in some areas of communities that would visit, but do they? I think the significant opportunities therefore to grow nature based and heritage, leisure and tourism industries. There are strong links to mainstream heritage, cultural and religious tourism. People visiting Lincoln Cathedral, York Minster, Beverly, etc, etc. There are links to natural resources of the area and regional heritage tourism through things like crafts and arts and foods, the farming community, the landscape. What you have to do is establish brands and images. You need to think about unique selling points. You need to think about what's going to bring the, the customer in. How can you tempt them? How can you whet their appetite? So in a wetland, lowland landscape with reed beds and things, then there's always the possibility of starling murmurations or other spectacular flocks of particularly wintering birds or birds on migration. You need to think about the facilities, the experience, the staff, and the quality of this. What's the quality of the experience? So the Yorkshire Wildlife Park, I think, is a really good example of this, where you've got a very strong education, very strong visual impact, very strong visitor experience. And if you're in a presently weak tourism situation, but maybe with a stronger uh, local or day visitor, uh, base, then you may want to grow gradually over time, grow the resources, grow the, the infrastructure and limit the risk. Whatever you do should enhance the visitor attraction, not diminish it. And that's not always the case. And I use the example of Land's End, where it's a huge visitor attraction, but basically it was wrecking the place. And towards the end, that was actually a deliberate strategy of the owners in order to get a a buyout uh, for them a, a very favorable price the long-term scenario for the area has been very good um, but it was a quite unpleasant way to deal with it i think so regional strategies and a regional understanding is very important who and where you are 
if the region is not region is not fully established in the tourism market, then you need to assess the visitor base of local and day visitors, the low hanging fruit. You may remain a sustainable destination for local and day visitors without making the leap to fully fledged tourists. And yeah, for local economies, this is actually not as significant as is sometimes believed or suggested. Because retaining inward spend can be as effective as bringing in external money, and it can actually be a lot easier. There may also be problems of a visitor experience. So say people want spectacles and spectaculars, and the murmurations, in some cases, you might be viewing a million or two million birds in a single flock. I mean, they are awe-inspiring, and they can bring in thousands and thousands of visitors. The problem we have is that sometimes these experiences are not reliable. We have one in the Peak District, which when it's booming is absolutely fantastic, but it's not consistent from year to year. And therefore, as I've already said, the private sector investment that you need doesn't follow because private sector cannot risk having a bad year. Bad year and you're out of business. So there are issues with that. If we want the benefits, then there are issues of public investments. If we want the benefits, we have to pay the price. So very often we have to invest public money to develop growth poles, economic growth poles, biodiversity growth poles. Then the visitors will come. If the visitors come, then the business investment will follow. Business follows, it doesn't lead. And as I say, there are issues of predictability. You want a spectacle, you want a spectacular, you also need a plan B. Because what you don't want is people going away disheartened, dissatisfied. Finally, just one thing to think about is the uh, long-term dilemma in conservation, is, which is the argument between conservation and creation, and also discovery versus packaging. So are you allowing people to find things for themselves and to discover and to understand, or do you package it and tell them and lead them by the hand? In terms of conservation and creation, one of the arguments, which I remember going back many, many years, um, was between, for example, the botanists and the bird watchers. And the botanists wanted to conserve the landscape. And the bird watchers, basically, the botanists felt wanted duck ponds. Because if you dig a wetland, if you create a, a lake or a pond, then the birds will come. So there can sometimes be issues of that. And there are bird reserves I've been to, particularly in East Anglia, where there's a huge pressure for bird watching facilities and to get the birds in. They want breeding birds, they want passage birds, uh, wintering birds, etc. But when you look at it, they're actually not, these are creating habitats to bring down the birds for the bird watchers. They're not necessarily conserving landscapes, which themselves have heritage and importance. Um, an example of this I will give you is actually in Lincoln Church at Walter Point, the site that I love. But you've got a, a, an internationally protected wetland landscape, and the dynamic of that landscape is why it's protected. And yet in the middle of the freshwater marsh, they dug a huge lozenge-shaped pond. Now that I see has enhanced the bird watching experience dramatically because you get avocets and spoon bills and all sorts of stuff there, which you didn't necessarily get before. I think now it's, they're doing developments on the other side of the road on what was arable land, intensive arable land, and that's not damaging. But to build that actually onto the freshwater marsh, which is a protected landscape, I think was highly questionable from a pure conservation point of view. From a, a tourism economics point of view, I fully understand it. But we have to then decide, are we a business enterprise or are we into conservation? So it's a question. I do like this one from the far side. You have to be careful what you wish for. This is preserved wildlife. So wildlife preserves. Finally, just to think about this site, which I've talked about, 
uh, RSPB Down Valley and Old Moor Wetland Centre. Absolutely fantastic facility. Brilliant for birds. The boot bittens are booming again. This has got everything. It's got the spectaculars. It's got the spectacles. It's got the rarities, the black terns. It's got them reliably. Uh, Mediterranean gull, I think they bred. Uh, and of course, the tree sparrows. So it may be nice birds that you see regularly. It may be rarities. It may be spectaculars, whatever. It brings people in. It brings in the public. It brings in the specialist bird watchers and it brings in the tourists. So that is a win-win scenario. Thank you very much. I hope that's been informative and interesting.